In this section, we'll be looking at China's Zhou Dynasty and the concept of the Mandate of Heaven. To do that, though, we need to talk about the decline and fall of the Shang Dynasty. In part, we need to understand how the Shang became so weak that the Zhou Dynasty was able to overthrow the ruling family, but also it's important to understand that the explanation for why the Shang fell into decline, uh, which was basically created by the Zhou, was to justify the Zhou overthrowing the Shang. So let me kind of restate that. When the Shang got weak and were overthrown, the Zhou, who overthrew the Shang, had to explain why it was okay for them to do so. And so they and their later allies and supporters developed a story, a narrative, that said why it was right for them to overthrow the Shang. So what I'm going to tell you next about the decline of the Shang dynasty, we, you need to understand is a kind of propaganda. It's not necessarily 100% true, though I think there is a kernel of truth to it. Uh, but we do need to understand it because it will help us understand the concept of the mandate of heaven. But the story goes that King Di Jin, the last monarch, the last king of the Shang, started off as a good monarch, but gradually became corrupt and engaged in all sorts of immoral activities. For example, there's a story that he built like a pool and filled the pool with alcohol and then put in the middle an island and on the island had a tree planted, but hung from the tree was cooked deer meat. So the idea was he just liked to hang around in his island, putting his hand in the water to get alcohol whenever he wanted it and then pulling down deer meat when he was hungry. And of course, not only would that have been very expensive, but also it was um, the, uh, um, it's not the kind of thing a king is supposed to be doing. A king is supposed to be focusing on ruling, not lazing around drinking and eating. Now that is a false story. It's not true, but that was a story told about King Di Xin to show, try and show he was really corrupt. Um, there's also stories that he liked to have orgies with his court, um, massive, massive orgies that he liked to write erotic poetry, and that when he wrote erotic poetry, he had bad rhythm. And that may sound kind of odd to us to criticize someone for not writing very good poetry, but the idea in Chinese society traditionally has been that if you have a good moral character, your poetry will be good, because if you're a good person, you're kind of in line with the cosmos, and uh, they, they kind of connected the good and the beautiful. So if you're a good person, naturally your poetry would be beautiful. But his poetry was not only about, um, you know, sex and, and things that a king isn't supposed to be thinking about too much. Uh, but it also had bad rhythm showing he was kind of out of step with the universe. Now, what's also interesting about these stories, and there's lots of these stories. A lot of them I think are probably false. But this is how the Zhou dynasty is trying to justify why they could overthrow this guy. There's something else we need to talk about Chinese civilization. So the story goes that, like I said, he was a pretty good guy, but his wife, Da Jin, who's, that's her kind of uh, monument to her on the right, she was a really, really bad woman, and she corrupted him, right? She led him astray. So he was a pretty okay guy, but then this evil woman led him astray. How bad was she? Well, there's a story that uh, she saw a peasant walking barefoot across the ice and was amazed and curious about how peasants could do that. So she had his feet cut off so she could examine them. Uh, there's a story that there was a pregnant woman and she wanted to see just how babies develop. So she had the pregnant woman killed and had the baby cut out so she could see that. Again, these stories are probably false, but the idea here, right, the kind of, uh, kind of patriarchy here is that you have this rotten woman who's just rotten. She's just bad. And she can corrupt men if they aren't careful. And this is meant to be kind of a justification to keep women out of power, basically. That, that's what that's there for. Um, whatever the story goes, how much of this stuff is true, my guess is that these are exaggerations. There's a very good chance that instead what you had was you did have a king who liked pleasure too much, who didn't spend a lot of time working hard to be a king, and who didn't use the taxes people were paying, the money uh, of the government. He wasn't using them well. And this helped lead to decline. But the key thing is that this propaganda that's being put out is being used to justify the Zhou taking power. So Shang Dynasty is getting weak. And there's another family who will found the Zhou Dynasty 
that are around and they don't like the Shang dynasty. Um, they think the Shang dynasty is weak and bad and they're going to take action against them. And fortunately, you know, um, if the propaganda is to be believed, we got this terrible Shang King, but there's this wonderful guy, Wu of Zhou, who is going to overthrow the, the, the um, Shang and establish the Zhou dynasty in power. And he will establish a new dynasty and become king. Right, so you're going to have the establishment of the Zhou dynasty by this guy, Wu of Zhou. So we got a new dynasty, new ruling family, right? You had one ruling family ruling, running the Shang dynasty. They've been overthrown. Now you've got the Zhou dynasty. But there's a problem here. Remember how I said earlier how there was this idea that the royal ancestors were like gods and were really powerful? And um, the king was like a mediator between like the gods and and heaven and earth and all that. How do you justify that? Right? If the king is so close to the gods and the anse powerful ancestral spirits, how do we justify overthrowing that king, even if he's kind of a bad guy? And so the Joe developed this thing um, called the Mandate of Heaven to explain why it was okay for them to overthrow the Shang. Basically, the Chinese believed that there was a something like God, not, they weren't monotheists. It was a high god, not the only god, that they called heaven or, you know, the sky god. And they believed that heaven, the sky god, was moral, was good, was benevolent, and cared about humanity. And the Chinese referred to China as literally all under heaven. Uh, in Chinese, Tianha, which literally means heaven under. And they believed that because China was so important, it was literally the center of the universe, that the sky god, heaven would choose the ruler of China for the good of the people, or rather, I should say, the dynasty. So basically, heaven is going to choose good people, the dynasty, the family, to rule China, because China is so important and heaven is benevolent. Okay, well, you may say, well, wait a second, that still doesn't solve anything, right? So why, if the Shang had the mandate of heaven, why was it okay for the Zhou to take it? Well, the key thing is, according to the Zhou, you can lose the mandate of heaven. The Di Xin, the last king of the Shang, according to the Zhou, was behaving really badly. Like I said, was having orgies, was um, you know writing bad poetry and so forth. And he was in danger of losing the mandate of heaven. Now, heaven is benevolent, is good. And so heaven warned the Shang with multiple omens things like eclipses and earthquakes and other astronomical phenomenon or natural disasters saying, look, I'm not happy with you, Shang. You're doing a bad job and you need to mend your ways and become moral or you're going to lose the mandate of heaven. And the, the uh, Di Xin refused to change. So the mandate was transferred to Zhou. And this story is going to become very important in Chinese history. This story is told in what's called the book of history. I love that book, of course, you can guess, right? I'm a historian. Like I say, all these terrible things about Di Xin are probably exaggerated. They're probably not true. Like I said, the story about the alcohol pool is false. But what's key here, what I want to emphasize, is the political theory of the mandate of heaven. In order, you had a dynasty. The Shang dynasty was not doing a good job anymore. Whatever we want to say about whether how corrupt Di Xin or not, the fact was... The Shang Dynasty had become weak. It was having trouble bringing peace and stability to China. And so you had this new rising power, Wu of Zhou, who wants to set things right, who wants to bring stability, who knows he can do a better job. And he needs a way of justifying overthrowing the Shang. So in Chinese political theory, you have this idea that, yes, heaven chooses who's going to be in charge. But if they become a bad ruler you can get rid of them and we'll have a new dynasty. And so in Chinese political theory, you have a moral justification for rebellion against a bad government. If the government does not do its job, you can get rid of it and that's perfectly okay, right? That's the moral thing to do. In fact, it's your duty to do so. If heaven chooses you to establish a new government, it is your duty. And like I said, this story is told in a history book. And Chinese people can read. And so this worldview, this political theory, is going to be spread 
among the Chinese elite. It doesn't matter what language they speak. They read the same language. And so that idea is going to be spread among them. So what can we say about the Zhou dynasty? Well, one thing I want to stress, notice how it's bigger. We saw this map in the Shang dynasty uh, section, but notice here's Shang, here's Zhou. They got a lot bigger. Good for them, right? They're expanding. And I want to stress, they actually expanded down to another river, the Yangtze. Why is that a big deal? We could have had two separate civilizations here. Just like that, you know, there's a separate Germany, there's a separate France, there's a separate Spain. You could have had a, a civilization here and a civilization here that were never unified. But the Zhou were able to not only hold on to this area, but to expand down here and include the Yangtze. That's pretty impressive. But here's the problem. How do you hold things together across such a distance? Right? Remember, we talked about this problem that empires have. You conquer someone, they maybe don't want to stay conquered. They would like to rebel. And as soon as you get weak, oh boy, are they going to rebel against you. So what do you do about it? Well, the Joe's answer, or the Joe, we can say, they need to have people who are both competent, who can govern this area, but are also loyal. If the Joe dynasty wants to rule, if it wants to hold this vast territory, it needs people who are competent and loyal. People who will do the job well and do it to benefit the Zhou dynasty. And they develop a feudal system. What is a feudal system? In a feudal system, you give a government, a king, I should say, gives land to nobles in exchange for military service. So a king of the Zhou would say to some powerful nobles who supported him, who were loyal, who maybe fought battles with him, would say to them, okay, you, you did a good job the last battle. I'm giving you, you know, a thousand acres. You did an even better job. I'm giving you 5,000 acres. And you, you did a great job. You get 10,000 acres. You get that land. You're going to use it however you want. Except... When I tell you to, you have to send me soldiers. I gave you a thousand um, acres of land, so you, if I need you to, you need to give me ten chariots. You, you gave me, I gave you five thousand. You need to give me fifty chariots. I gave you ten thousand acres. You got to give me a, a hundred chariots. So that's the idea. I give you this land. You hold on to the land. You get to use the profits however you want, as long as you're loyal to me. You govern it for me. Keep the peace. And if I need you to, you give me military service because I maybe have to defend the country against a major threat. I maybe need to expand. I maybe need to put down a rebellion, whatever. I give you land, you give me military service. This works really well for a time. And that's key to why the Joe, as well as things like writing and, and all that stuff, that's one reason why they're able to expand. However, there's a problem. Over space and time... Bonds of loyalty become weak. The further you are away from the Joe King, the less you see him, the less you communicate with him. And over time, that bond weakens. You can kind of think about this. Like if you haven't seen a friend for years, you maybe don't feel as close to them anymore. Right? There may be relatives who you don't feel particularly close to, even though biologically you're close because you never see them. Whereas relatives who you aren't biologically close to, you know, distant cousins, you may see them every day, so you feel closer to them. And so what happens is, over time, these bonds become weak, and people don't think of the land as belonging to the king, or as a gift from the king. They just say, it's mine. What do you mean the king gave me this land? This land is mine. And if the land is mine, why do I have to give the king chariots? I don't want to give the king chariots. I want to keep them myself. And you can kind of think about it this way. You may be loyal to the king, Right? You maybe fought with the king in battles. You maybe saw the king a lot. But will your great-grandchildren be loyal to his great-grandchildren? They maybe have nothing to do with any, each other. They may never have seen each other. And so those bonds of loyalty become really weak. The great-grandchildren start to think of the land as their land. They've never seen the king. They don't remember the king giving it to them. They've lived on it their whole life. They don't think it's a gift. 
And they certainly don't understand why they have to send their chariots to go serve the king. They would much rather keep them to either expand the land themselves, maybe attack their neighbor, who might also be a lord who's supposed to serve the king. Or they may just not feel like it. So while this works for a time, the system does start to unravel. And that will lead to decline and division within the Zhou dynasty. Basically, you're going to have this loyal the this we loyalty will weaken the loyalty people think feel towards the Zhou. And what will happen is, remember how I said you may want to keep your chariots. You may want to invade your neighbor, right? As the Zhou dynasty breaks apart, you know this. You may be the lord in charge of this little area. You may say, you know what? I'd like to invade here. I want this territory here. I want this little bit. This would be nice to have. And you may want to invade. So you don't want to give your ter- chariots to the Joe King. You want to invade. You want him to attack here. This person, of course, doesn't want to give the chariots to the Joe King either. He wants to keep them. By the way, do you notice if you pronounce Joe King um, really quickly, it sounds like joking? I think that's hilarious. But the key thing here is you've got this fighting now between aristocrats. Their loyalty was to the king, not necessarily to each other. And that loyalty has disappeared over time and over space. And the king has become so weak because he's given away so much land, he can't actually stop these guys from fighting. The Joe king may say, hey, look, I don't want you to invade that vassal. You're both loyal to me. You shouldn't be fighting. And the vassals may just say, okay, who's going to stop us? You? Where's your army? Our army is bigger than yours, and the other people aren't going to help you anyway, so you can't really do anything. So eventually, over time, the Joe King became incredibly weak. How weak did he become? He was actually killed by his own people. And the capital was attacked, and he was forced to try and move to another place. And after that was basically incredibly weak, and then full-scale civil war breaks out. So the situation, in a sense, for China has become quite dire. Right, had been unified, had been expanding, but now it's dividing. And so you've got this question, who will put China back together again? It's fallen apart. And each one of these little kingdoms, I believe at one point there was like seven, each one would like to put the whole thing back together again. But how will it be done? How are you going to put this together again once it fell? This old system didn't work. Right, This feudal system worked for a time, but it led to division. What kind of system will we develop that will work? And this is key. This will determine whether China will be one country or not. Of course, spoiler alert, China is one country, but how they manage to reunite and to understand division as weird and unity as normal is something we'll have to continue in another section.